Hello, welcome to another edition of Dr. Bickmore's Why Wednesday Interviews, and today I'm in conversation with Kathy um, Erskine, who is one of my favorite young adult authors of all times. I, I can remember first reading Mockingbird and, and just being overwhelmed with not only the craftsmanship, but just the beauty of the language, and, and in, for my money, the love um, that the author has for the characters. You know, you just, these are all characters who are, uh, in my mind, well-loved as they're portrayed, and I think readers find that too. So here we are to talk about what's currently up with Kathy, and um, later in the conversation, we hope to be joined by um, Keith Henry Brown, who is a co-author and an illustrator of a book that's right behind Kathy, as you look there. Mm -hmm. um, my dad is a DJ, so... Well, Kathy, why don't you update us and what what recent projects have you finished or what do you have on the horizon so that people who follow you kind of can put on their look forward to list? <laughs> well, thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, I think that the novel I'm most excited about now is out on submission. So I don't know if it's actually going to be published. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but it is a uh, novel in verse and it is... I think reminiscent of Mockingbird because the main character is young, but dealing with a difficult subject, which is basically the divide in our country right now. So it's seeing it through his eyes as a confused kid, because I think in some ways we're, we're all of that. We're confused about what's going on and why. Uh, I also recently have done a couple of biographies which were really fun I didn't think that would be my sort of thing since I'd like to do fiction but uh I do love research so it was fun to do those as well yeah well what uh, can you tell us who the biographies are about I mean one one is out right you have one yes. that's out yeah they're both for the core knowledge foundation so they're online and print and used mostly by schools I think mm -hmm. uh and one is about Abraham Lincoln, which was really fun to research. And the latest one is about Leonardo da Vinci, which was also interesting. But sadly, there are very few stories about his early childhood like there are about Lincoln. So yeah. it was a little more of a challenge to make interesting for, for kids. So when you write a book like that for them, why don't you tell us a little bit about what kind of specs they give you? Do they give you a page range or a word count and yeah. say, spend this much on the childhood, this much on the the events? So tell us a little bit about what kind of restrictions you're right. working within. They're, they are pretty flexible, though, uh, for a fifth grade level, which is what I was writing for, it's between nine and 10,000 words. Uh, and that may or may not include the sidebars. Either we can be yeah. a little wiggly about those, which is nice. And then there's back matter, so there can be some extra info there. Uh, but it, it's kind of a fun challenge to try make a biography and history interesting to kids. Yeah, well, and certainly there's a lot of us that ended up as English teachers that thought we were going to be history majors, and then decided, well, they maybe even have to read more than we do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we we drift to, you know, the love of literature, but so much the compatibility of, of English teachers and social studies teachers. In fact, I, I know a couple of colleagues who are really active in Allen who teach primarily um, history classes. Um, so they, they teach a lot of nonfiction and, and of course, uh, combine the teaching of literature with the teaching of real events and mm -hmm. that becomes kind of a a robust avenue to um, getting kids interested in the real versus the imaginary right yeah it's so interesting and it's sort of like how uh, a lot of authors for young people are ex-lawyers because we um love to read we love to research we love to write but then we decided we wanted to write fun stuff. <laughs> so maybe maybe we should form a small Allen group that I should uh, do a panel, um, ex-lawyers for 
YA literature or recovering lawyers for <laughs> YA literature. Exactly. <laughs> you said that, and I can immediately think of two other people that I that I know write YA that were attorneys, and I think that may be a bigger club than I imagined. It is, but... yeah, I think it might be. <laughs> Yeah, Th that's fascinating. <laughs> so if I call you up one day and say, I'm going to do a panel at NCTE about the value of being an ex-attorney who's now <laughs> writing young adult literature, you'll know that you're the you're the reason that panel exists. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, in fact, doing that, that's, that leads me to something else that I'm, I'm really interested in how different authors take this on. Um, there's all kinds of legal precedents with censorship and contracts for school visits and visiting a school and how they redefine your First Amendment rights when you're visiting a school. And, and I understand all of that when you're setting up the beginning, uh, but we recently had um, uh, Padma wrote for the blog a couple of weeks ago yeah. where she was kind of disinvited after she'd been invited and to the point where they had to pay her, but then, you know, and then it happened during band book week as well. So the timing of all of that. Right. So what's your take on some of those issues about, you know, setting up that contract in advance or having book censored? Where do you fall legally when you think about that? How do you think about it? Uh, well, I have insurance just in case I'm sued for doing anything. <laughs> but um, like Padma, I'm a big believer in just being open and being allowed to talk about anything that the kids want to talk about. And uh, I have only, I've had an experience once where my school visit was canceled because uh, I guess the principal found out that Mockingbird referenced a school shooting and there had been one nearby uh, within the past year or two so she didn't want to have it and of course my feeling would be better to talk about it than just ignore it but that was fine and my other experience was uh, a, a school not wanting me to talk about the incredible magic of being because it has gay moms who are married uh -huh. and it's not a book about that they just happen to be and uh and it wasn't the focus of my talk anyway but i said if somebody brings it up i'm not going to not talk about it i mean i don't have a reason to particularly bring it up but I'm not going to ignore it if somebody wants to talk about it. And that seemed to be enough of a compromise for them. Okay. Well, that, well, and I think that's, it seems that word compromise has been lost in the shuffle of everything, right? If, if you're having negotiations as you come and you say, well, this is how I'm approaching the talk. And in fact, I know increasingly more and more authors are sending their PowerPoints in advance and saying, this is what I would, these are the things I'm going to highlight. Um, but if those conversations happen in front in negotiations and the, and the principal or the committee of parents can talk about what they feel is appropriate for their school in kind of a discussion way, that that's a completely different thing than surprising you out of the blue that. Yes. Right. You know, I agree. <laughs> you're doing that well and do you then write your own contracts for these visits do you have a kind of a boiler boilerplate contact that you contract you use or <laughs> well <laughs> yes I do and it's about like three lines long I mean it's embarrassing that I am a lawyer and I really don't focus on that very much at all I mean I basically have a few things that I say and that is it and I really should especially in today's environment, maybe put a little bit more in there. Yeah. Uh, so, which is... Well, maybe less is more too, if it can be, right? But yeah, you're wondering right. that. And I, so I'm, I'm, that's, I'm very interested. I would, when your book gets accepted, which I'm sure it will, even if you have to shop it a couple of times, I'm really interested in that, that conversation about um, how we are, how kids are navigating the inability of adults in America to work together and to compromise and to 
and and to talk openly about uh, government issues. I mean, frankly, I kind of long for the days where um, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan could sit across the table from each other and call each other idiots, but agree <laughs> on, on agree on something that would move something forward. And I, I don't think we have that um, oh. to the same degree that we used to. I'm, and another example is people forget that uh, Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch were good friends, really good friends, and and would hash over things. And and maybe some of the stuff we have for child and welfare services exists uh, because Ted Kennedy was pushing them and Orrin Hatch said, okay, reasonably, I can support this, right? Mm -hmm. but, hey. but I think we don't see that. If, if it's happening, we don't see it very often, right? We no. don't know who we would anchor those conversations around. Right. Right. So. Right. And it's a it's a terrible example. It's also a a terrible burden for for kids because there there's like not much option. If you can't rely on the adults in your life to figure out problems, that's kind of scary. That's not yeah. a good place to be. Are you gonna are are you so I'm I'm really interested in the logistics of this book because I'm wondering how much social media is gonna play. Um how do you determine when you hear newscasts or problems, how do you determine truth from from fiction? Exactly. Are those are the kind of issues that are going to go on in the book? Yes, I mean it's all touched on fairly briefly. Like the mom was watching the news and how important that is to her, and then the, there's an older brother who's 14 who um, does not uh, says she should be watching something different, and uh, so there's tension over that and the fact that the father was a police officer who was killed uh in a demonstration mm -hmm. so um yeah so another reason for it to be in verse is it is obviously a heavy topic and a lot of difficult things so it's easier to approach in little little bites and through the eyes of an innocent I know a, a lot of authors, and maybe I like your take on this. Um, with when you write novels in verse or verse novels, or um, the the debate is still out there. Actually, I've worked on a couple of articles about how we're framing novels in verse or <laughs> verse novels and what we privilege in the discussion. But everybody seems to value the white space that's created by writing poetry, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you you have a a shorter piece, but between the lines or between the poems, um, there's room for imagination or there's room for interpretation. Is that how you see it in some ways? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of fill in the blank, literally. You, you yeah. can do. Um, and, and also, I just think it makes it more approachable to, to kids, especially I, I am sensitive to kids with learning issues since... Yes. Uh, my son had real reading problems and a book like um love that dog a tiny little book you know when he was in elementary school was something that he could handle little yeah. short snippets uh and i i would like people to be able to anyone to be able to feel they can pick up that book and read it and not be overwhelmed I tend yeah. to be overwhelming in my writing because I write a lot. <laughs> so I, yeah, that's that's interesting. You feel that way because I, I, the books I know of yours well, seen read, Mockingbird, and and a couple of others that you've you've mentioned. I I think your writing is pretty sparse and direct. But you see yourself as an overwriter or is, are you talking about the process in, in <laughs> when you finally get to it? Because I think um, I, I, yeah. I would put you as in one of the, in the group that I think, I think you're really crafting books. I, you know, you're not just writing a narrative. I think um, in, in fact, people, you know, as a, the diehard English teacher in me, you know, we want to parse and explicate everything you do. And, and I think yours are books that, that explicate and you can treat as as it is as literature every bit as much as you could treat you know Steinbeck or Hemingway or somebody else that we might be teaching in our ninth or tenth grade English classes we we don't give um, many young adult authors the credit of writing well crafted books so I'm interested in how you frame yourself then. <laughs> 
Well, I think it's just when you pick up something like where is seeing red here, um, it just it looks dense, you know. I mean, there's just a lot yeah. of writing, and and it's not a thin book. Yes. So some kid could pick it up and think, oh, that's a lot. I don't think I can get through that. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I have pared it down to what's important, but right. that, that is always a challenge for me. Like in um, The Absolute Value of Mike, I had a whole chapter <clears throat> where my editor said, you know, this is funny, it's great, but it is sort of like taking a little rest stop off the highway because it's not directly adding to anything that we don't already know so you need to cut it um and and she was right it was better cut yeah yeah well that's that's interesting that you say that so you you haven't felt restricted to write um i know there's a couple of of authors now who are really trying to write books that are under 150 pages maybe even under 125 because they're writing directly to a middle school audience that maybe has had trouble reading lengthier books, right? Right, yeah. But if we look at both of your books, Mockingbird or, or Seeing Red specifically, middle grades kids can read those books fairly fluently if they're readers and if the size of the book doesn't intimidate them out the door, right? So, right, right. Exactly. And, and maybe that's the distinction is... Um, is what it looks like to the kids initially, right? What what am yeah. I gonna what am I gonna react to this? That's a lot of it. Just like a um, book jacket is makes a big difference. That's why book jackets have to be updated because somebody will pick it up and go, "Ew, this looks." Yeah, so cool. it's, yeah. I I think that's that's and more and more, uh, you know, people all the time, you know, my, my siblings and, and their children who now have children, you know, are saying, well, what do you recommend? And I think, well, I, you know, I, I'm, it's harder and harder for me to pinpoint a book. What I tend to do is say, well, look at some of the middle grade writers and I'll tend to give them a series group of authors because oh, right. I don't always know their kid or what they're doing. And I, I'm becoming yeah. more and more entrenched in the Donna Miller group of let them read whatever they want, but give them plenty of opportunity to find books. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. go to the library with them, pull down a few books and say, what do you think of these? Let them pull some books. And it probably drives the librarian nuts if I go and there's 25 <laughs> books, you know, need to be reshelved, you know. But, but I think that's the approach where kids can, like you say, with your son, maybe seeing a short book about a topic that he would gravitate to let him read the first, first book and and then the next book and then the next book um I, so i find that very interesting that you're attuned to that as as a as a writer right mm -hmm. uh, as a writer as a mom as somebody who's talked to kids you know those are the kinds of things that and and just the freedom of choice is so important i mean i was uh, an early reader i'm still not a fast reader at all but i i read early so but i was allowed to read anything so i remember in like fourth grade i was at the same time i was reading uh to kill a mockingbird uh encyclopedia brown mysteries and casper the friendly ghost comics so <laughs> Well, and it, you know, even a good reader it just depends on your mood what you feel like reading and i i'm grateful that i had that kind of an upbringing also access to any books in the house uh which yeah. is that different. was yeah my my dad they you know reading was really encouraged in my house but not like forced but he bought um like an estate a set of books once and this would have been in the 60s and and these books were the series that you might remember we were there books you know we oh, were there yes. at the driving of the golden spike or we were there at you know and yes. and so we had these collection of books that maybe 20 or 30 in those titles and then the same series i don't remember who published them biographies that were written for kids from maybe five to nine and and as a reader then i was reading those biographies of Ben Franklin or whoever, and then thinking, well, certainly this isn't the whole story, right? And then would go to the library and get a little bit more sophisticated 
biography, right? Because yes. as that a reader, right. it wasn't quite satisfying all the curiosity that I had. Right. And so I was um, reading all the, uh, reading all those books, but I was free to kind of roam. I, I can remember probably fifth or sixth grade going to the bookmobile and having seen a portion of Moby Dick on TV or something with Gregory Peck. Right. And I thought, all right. well, I, I should read Moby Dick. I like to read, <laughs> you know, and I I checked it out and took it home and you know maybe read the first page and said well I'm not reading that but then my 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 life became kind of a cycle of checking out Moby Dick and not reading it until I was a freshman in college and then I was kind of ready to read it right and yes and, and exactly. it remains one of the one of my favorite books and people say well why do you like that book and I I don't know why I tell people why, but if I were to choose 10 or 15 books to take with me somewhere, it's one I'm going to take, right? And mm -hmm. but, but I had to come to it slowly on my own terms, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. And that's the other thing is some of these books like a picture books, a picture book biography is a great stepping stone to I want to know more about this person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that those those kinds of things are are, are wonderful to let kids explore. And now, with, so in that same notion, when you visit schools and talk to kids, have they ever asked you why you haven't written something else or some other book? Or are they pushing you about your career? And say, <laughs> well, this book is nice, but what about this? Yeah, yeah. sometimes you'll have uh, a kid who loves like science fiction or something. Have you written any science fiction? <laughs> Afraid not. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, or they want a sequel of, of a particular book, or they want a character from a book taken out and have a separate book about oh. that character. Th things like that, which is which is always kind of cool that they yeah you know, are uh, connecting with some of the characters. Yeah. So, what are some of the interesting conversations you've had with kids? You say. Well, I'm not going to talk about it lest they bring it up. So what are the some of the things that kids have either brought up or that you find enriching when you have conversations? And and does it vary with age groups? You have different conversations with different levels kids. Tell me a little bit about some of those experiences. Yeah, I mean, one thing that pops into my head immediately is talking with kids about Mockingbird. If they are 10 or younger, they want to know why the dad is so mean. And if they're 11 and up, they understand that the dad is traumatized and in grief. And uh, so they feel bad for him. But it's yeah. so interesting to see that developmental shift. Yeah. yeah. Like the dad yeah. is mean because he's not providing for her and taking yeah. care of her. But... Uh, yeah. And isn't very communicative, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that there's a very interesting divide about when kids become more aware of how to how to identify that as a character. That's that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, how many years now from Mockingbird? Let's track that down. Yes, yeah, 2010. It was published. So. So we're almost at 15 years, 13 years, um, and. How is how do you feel like it's being received? And is it getting does it get more play when there's a school shooting again? Or does it or is it just kind of living its life right now? Yeah, I think that does tend to happen, unfortunately, uh, when there's been a, a school shooting. Uh and but since Mockingbird, there have been so many more books written about kids yeah. on the spectrum in eventually by people who are on the spectrum which is fabulous i mean i i am really happy to see that and that's yeah i think and th and that's the strength of the book sometimes people see that book as a school shooting book and i think it's really more about um how the character is is portrayed and how the character is seen and understood as a reader that's the that's the power of the book right that yeah. yeah somebody who's learning to feel things right <laughs> or express emotions right mm -hmm. and 
And I, I sometimes think, I probably sometimes need a chart, you know, it's, it's yes. no, oh, me it's, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, so I, I think that that's, uh, that's really good, but I, that's one of those books that, uh, in fact, one of the reasons that I'm interested in doing an interview series is I'm interested in catching a few, um, authors of books that, because after a decade, sometimes books, um, they're not in the book fairs. They're not in the in the clubs, and and I I don't think that they we we are not developing a canon the way that, for lack of a better word, classical or contemporary literature is building right, and and that worries me just a little bit because I think with every new trend or every new cycle or every new uh, rock star author, you know, as the social media comes, we are not tracking um books that we ought to keep track of um and and certainly for me mockingbird is one of those books and 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 i can think of several others um it's that if we just take books that have won the national book award for example um i'm not sure all of them we should remember but i mm. i think godless should be remembered i i think um i i still think that the um the oh Holt's book, um, Zachary Beaver, when Zachary Beaver comes to oh, town. Yeah. I think I think that's a book that's now probably 25 years old. And I think I still like that book every time I look at it and thumb through it and, and, and read it and have taught it. But none of those books are taking on the same kind of um, logistical cachet, say, of The Outsiders or, yes. of, or of The Contender. Um, Maybe even something like Homecoming, Cynthia Voigt's Homecoming has some legs that some of these books don't have. And I, I worry about that. So I'm, while well, you guys are writing away in the new book, I'm sometimes worried about your lost books. Right? Oh, <laughs> that's very nice because like you say, I mean, to me, my characters are people. I mean, I, I really feel for them. I uh, have put a lot of myself in them I mean they just come to me and start talking so it's like a like a real person it's not something I made up out of whole cloth and just wrote about it really is like this this talking being who has come to visit me <laughs> <laughs> well that's a that's a really good transition into your writing process that we could talk for a little bit about um the inspiration for your books then do they always come when you're writing and because uh, I'm I'm assuming this about you that you're very diligent you wake up you try to write <laughs> but uh, are as you once before you have a project where do the ideas come from do they often come from a voice as you're sketching and writing or yeah definitely I mean I, th I think the the major theme comes from something that I'm experiencing in my world, whether it's my family or our country or the world, it's something that I'm processing without even realizing that, that that's what I'm doing. As my husband says, it's my, my therapy. I put it out there for everyone to solve for me, <laughs> but, uh, but definitely luck, it, right? <laughs> it starts in the form of, a character talking in my head. I mean, when I was writing, uh, working on Seeing Red, because that book took like 13, 14 years to actually finish, um, I was taking a walk just to clear my head, and it was really cold, and I was thinking, oh gosh, I wonder if it's about to snow, and this snarky teenage girl voice in my head said, it's too cold to snow, don't you know anything? And then she kept talking and that became Matt in Quaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, with the incredible magic of being, I remember uh, being you know, at the kitchen counter making these healthy pumpkin cookies for Thanksgiving that I figured, I don't know if anyone's even gonna eat these. And this little, I could, I could even see him, like this little nine-year-old next to me says, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be caught dead eating pumpkin cookies. I wouldn't be caught alive eating them either. And then he just went on and on and on. This kid would not shut up. 
So I uh, just, I mean, I just write down what they're saying. And then eventually they ta are talking with other characters. And I definitely know the setting. The plot is always a challenge for me. I'm like, uh, why are these people here? I don't know what I'm supposed to do with them. Okay. And I sort of have to write towards that. It kind of organically grows eventually. It's not an efficient so, way. Well, well, what you're telling people if you're if, with kids and others that are doing this is it's a big drafting process. So how many drafts do you think you have in a book? Do you, oh, or wow. are you, are, is the first one hard to count because it's rewriting itself all the time? Yeah, I tend to do that. I am just constantly rewriting. So uh, I might have a couple of super early versions, which are mostly like brain dumps. Uh, yeah. And then the actual draft is, just constantly being updated. Uh, but something like um, uh, Seeing Red, that I really did rewrite multiple times with completely different plots. <laughs> but but wow. I kept coming back to it because the characters wouldn't leave me alone. So I yeah. finally, I, I had to do it. You had to find the story. Well, I'm glad you did. I, I That's a book that I found... Um, and I, in fact, I don't know that I looked at that book until I had met you and we'd had some brief conversation. And I looked at it and I thought, um, I really think it's a really good telling of, of the subject matter of the conflict and the racial conflict that goes on. Um, because I think that's becoming harder and harder for white authors to write in a way yeah. that's readable for others because we have so much, so many expectations that are layered over that conversation. Um, and this one, Seen Red, feels really successful in that way for me. So I'm glad you stuck with it for a long time. I'm When you said that, I'm actually surprised that it was kind of a long book. But so there's the mask, right, between yeah, exactly. what the magic of the book and, and what the writers have been doing uh, for a long time, right? That's mm -hmm. That's really good so when you when you send it to an editor or to how painful does it feel to get the first thing you send to an editor back <laughs> you worked with so, so much that you think no this is it now i know we're going to tweak it or is the editor say no yeah you really need to work on this again or that again yes <laughs> yeah yeah it is uh it, it is an adjustment you have to you know read all the notes first and internalize them before reacting because you do tend to think oh my gosh how am I going to do all of this and she wants me to get rid of this sweet little character I love because he's not adding anything yeah. but I like him I want him in there so <laughs> um but eventually you you what, what I tell people is if um like if I'm critiquing their work if you uh are really convinced that something is needed in your book and I just I have said no and and I because I obviously just can't see it I'm not seeing your vision don't change anything because of me just you know think about it um and the only caveat is sometimes when you react like oh absolutely not no no you have a vehement reaction this is usually telling you oh, you're holding on to something that you should really be letting go of. At least that's what happens with me. I think, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. No. I remember the beginning of one book where my editor said, um, okay, it's nice, but we really need to like cut those first five pages and just get into the story. And I thought, oh, no, not in this case. In this case, we really need this introduction it's all this information so I sent it to Linda Urban good friend of mine um and asked her to read it and her son who was about the right age at the time and like 20 minutes later she emailed back oh honey your editor is right yeah. <laughs> those are painful because you want to hate that person and you really realize they have your best interest at heart. So you want to think, why do I hate this person right now and do that? And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hard thing to tell. You know, when I was in graduate school, we were getting ready to write our dissertation. I'd been in a writing group with uh, two other people and, and I'd written 
what I thought was a dynamite introduction to my dissertation. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and Sharon's reading it and she reads it for a minute and then she gets out a pen and puts a big X through the first three or four pages and she said, you don't need any of this. This is just all throat clearing. <laughs> you know, you're you're trying to make yourself feel good about, you know, you, you start over here. And, you know, after I was done being in shock, right, <laughs> for, for, for all this loving positioning of the topic I realized you know she was right but if but like you said I didn't throw any of that away I put it in a brain dump folder you know because maybe <laughs> somebody will come to their senses and realize <laughs> where were those four pages we cut you know <laughs> but that hasn't yeah. happened you know over the yeah. last 16 years <laughs> that doesn't right? to me either as a critique group um friend of mine said when she was reading one of my novels she she did the same thing I mean she's reading it she just went like this on the pages and she said Kathy it's all barf it's beautiful barf but it's barf. <laughs> well and I think and I think anybody who writes um whether it's academic writing or fiction writing or oh my word the number of ways that people who draft poems, you know, agonize over a line or a word, yes. you know, that the drafting is, is really hard work. And um, I'm currently teaching a class on just got to read the final projects over the next week on how to teach writing in the schools. And what I'm finding is we don't give much space to true revision in schools and and often teachers don't know how to grade it or give credit for it, but students aren't idiots. They realize that if the only thing you're going to grade is the final draft, then that's the only thing they have to do. And mm -hmm. whatever they turn in on the due date is the final draft, whether it's the first draft or the second draft. And, and so I've been trying to harp for a semester on, if you want kids to revise, you need to value the different processes in the writing process. You need to give a grade for the pre-writing. You need to give a grade for drafting so that the kids know that's valued. Yes. And not, right? Um, even though the grading is all artificial in the first place, right? right. Until, until they all own the work they're doing as something they want somebody to really evaluate, it's just exactly. pretend, right? That's what I always try and impress on kids when I do a school visit is how much I have to revise myself and then my critique group reads it and I revise again and then my agent reads it and I revise again and then the editor reads it and and each time it gets better and these people are just trying to help me bring out the best in me and it's like having a brand it's your yeah. trade. Do you yeah. want people to go in and see a book and think, oh, it's probably okay because it's written by this author? Or do you want them to think, oh, it's one of hers. Okay, I want to read that one. And that's that's what's important. Yeah, yeah. well, I think you are definitely getting a, a brand. But now, do you feel that all your books are of a type? Or do you feel they're different? I think I'm always pretty much looking for the same thing, which is uh, a family, and it can be an, any kind of family, a group of disparate people who become a family. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, tolerance, I think, and understanding, that's a big theme in my books, and you know, fairness and social justice. I mean, I, I just, I can't help talking about things like that. And I remember once uh, a boy challenging me saying so you're trying to make us think the way that you do and be liberal and, <laughs> and I said well you can probably tell my social political leanings from what I write but I'm not trying to get you to be anything I want you to have a reason for who you are not just because somebody told you to do something or feel something as long as you have a reason and justification for it but that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs>